Greetings, this is Greg. I want to talk about the range of the P-47 Thunderbolt and some of the myths involved. While researching this subject, I found the following statement on a well-written website dealing with this exact topic. Quote, One of the things that pops up again and again when researching World War II is how certain narratives get established in the historical record. Narratives that are often nowhere near the ground truth found in primary source documents of the time, but serve the bureaucratic powers that be in post-war budget battles. These narratives are repeated over and over again by historians without validating the narratives against either that theater's original wartime documents or those of other military theaters." Unquote. I agree. I have talked about this before on this channel. Historians and authors of books often use each other as sources in a circular fashion and end up repeating the same false statements over and over. It's a particularly big problem in World War II aviation history because the subject is technically complex enough that it requires a higher level of research or understanding than most other topics. In the case of the Thunderbolts range, the narrative we usually hear is that until the P-51 Mustang with the Merlin engine came along, the U.S. had no way to escort bombers into Germany, let alone deep into Germany. This is repeated over and over in books and documentaries, and even a cursory glance at the comments section on this channel will show that people bring this up all the time, but it's not true. A lot of people seem to be referencing this chart, or others like it, which at first glance supports their argument. However, at best, this chart is only comparing time periods and not airplanes. It's not showing a mid-1944 P-47 versus a mid-1944 P-51. Now we'll come back to this later. During the 1930s, the U.S. Army Air Corps was dominated by a group of officers often called the Bomber Mafia. This group believed that bombers were the key to victory and that fighters would not be able to stop them. There was a time in the 1930s when the new turbocharged bombers could fly high and fast enough to outrun and outdistance contemporary fighters. Those within the bomber mafia were technically knowledgeable within their field and they were very competent as bureaucrats. They succeeded in packing key positions with like-minded officers and prevented promotions of dissenters. One victim of this was Claire Chenault, later of Flying Tigers fame. The Bomber Mafia factored heavily into his early retirement in 1937. Ironically, that led to his opportunity in China to show just how vulnerable bombers were. So the Bomber Mafia was politically savvy, and they were very good at making sure that fighter and fighter projects took a backseat to bombers. It's important to understand that they did truly believe in their cause, and many other aviation experts around the world at the time were in agreement with them. Their theories were not all that wild in the 1930s. In fact, the theories didn't even originate with the Bomber Mafia. Nevertheless, these theories would not hold up over Germany in 1942. Because they didn't think that fighters could intercept bombers effectively, they also felt that escort fighters would be pointless. Now, if there's one thing that fighters in World War II needed to escort bombers on long missions, it was the drop tank. In 1939, the chief of the Army Air Corps, who was Henry H., or he goes, what typically went by Hap Arnold, uh, he was chief of the Army Air Corps at the time, he decreed that no fighters would have drop tanks. This would have dramatic ramifications. Thankfully, drop tank development continued anyway, largely for three reasons. First, the U.S. Navy wanted them, especially for maritime patrol aircraft. This Navy Lockheed Ventura carried 150-gallon external tanks, and of course, Lockheed also built the P-38 Lightning, and they quickly adapted these tanks to it. Second, many foreign customers wanted drop tanks, so that caused development to continue. Last but not least, the manufacturers were not prohibited from developing them at their own expense, and in many cases they actually needed to just to have enough range to effectively move the planes around. 
The P-47 Thunderbolts were equipped to carry drop tanks. The only exceptions are the first 171 airplanes built. Starting around September 1942, all Thunderbolts built were equipped to carry drop tanks. If we take a look at the official pilot's manual from January 1943, we find that the C and D models were set up to carry a single 200-gallon drop tank mounted on the belly. I should point out that Republic did make an odd conformal external fuel tank for the P-47. Admittedly, I don't know too much about it. Aside from this drawing, I could only find two pictures of it and minimal information. My guess, and this is totally a guess, is that it was built as a backup plan in the, ca in the case that the USAAF decided to enforce the no drop tank rule. That would at least allow P-47s to be ferried to Europe and the Soviet Union or anywhere else without too much difficulty. Back to the drop tank. Here's a picture from the manual. It holds 200 gallons and became available sometime between September of 1942 and January of 1943. It had no limitations and was fully flight tested. This is important because it means that at the very latest, by January of 1943, there was a fuel tank option for the Thunderbolt that would allow it to escort bombers deep into Germany. Now let's take a look at the Thunderbolt's range with and without this extra 200 gallons. Anytime we're talking about range, it's a bit tricky. There are some variables that have to be accounted for. These include amounts of reserve fuel, fuel used during warm-up, taxi, and climb-out, extra fuel burned during combat, those sort of things, and these numbers have a big effect on the results. Now back to the chart we talked about earlier. Without knowing the variables used, this data is pretty worthless. That 230 mile radius for an early Thunderbolt without drop tanks is actually a bit optimistic. Now I'll explain where those numbers came from later. When the USAAF started sending bombers on raids into Germany, it quickly became apparent that escort fighters were needed, or at least some sort of escort. However, rather than shipping over drop tanks for the P-47, they experimented with other ideas. These include the YB-40, which was a B-17 with no bombs and extra firepower to protect the formation. This was a failure for two main reasons. First, it couldn't really shoot down enemy fighters at an increased rate. And second, once the bombers had dropped their bombs, they had much more speed than the still heavily loaded YB-40. So they either had to slow down and spend more time over enemy territory, or leave the YB-40 behind. The other solution, which was better, but still not a real solution, was to send medium bombers in ahead of the heavy bombers as a distraction. If timed correctly, and if the Germans took the bait, this would buy a lot of time for the heavies. And this probably had some positive effect for the USAAF, but not nearly enough, and the Germans quickly figured out what they were doing. Thus, even when the bomber mafia started to understand that German fighters were a serious threat, both of their initial solutions involved bombers, not true escort fighters. This led to the disaster in the two Schweinfurt raids of 1943. These were two large raids intended to knock out the German ball bearing plants in Schweinfurt, Germany. I'll talk briefly about these two raids as they pertain to our topic today. The first raid was in August of 1943. Diversionary attacks were flown by US B-26 medium bombers and by RAF B-25 Mitchells and Hawker Typhoons. The heavies were escorted by Spitfires and by Thunderbolts with drop tanks. The Thunderbolts had more range than the Spitfires, but still not enough to reach Germany. Losses of heavy bombers on this raid were horrendous. About 20% of the total force was lost. 60 bombers and crews were lost outright. Many more were damaged beyond repair. A second Schweinfurt raid was launched in October. Once again, the Thunderbolts had, the Thunderbolt escorts had no drop tanks. This time, bomber losses were a staggering 77 bombers. 60 shot down, 17 had to be scrapped, 
That's about 26% of the total force. Many of the surviving planes were severely damaged, and of course there was huge loss of life. At this point, it was indisputable that unescorted daylight bombing wasn't really feasible against Germany. We're going to have to look at the P-47's range. This time we'll use a chart from an official source in September of 1943. I've zoomed in on the P-47 section here, and as you can see, they calculated a combat radius of about 150 miles for a P-47 with 305 gallons of internal fuel. Quick note, P-47s in Europe generally had two different internal fuel tank capacities. All the Razorbacks, with a few exceptions, had 305 gallons of internal capacity. And starting with the D25 model, which means all the bubble tops in Europe, they had 370 gallons. Now, there were a few late model Razorbacks that had 370, but for purposes of this discussion, uh, it's very safe to just assume that all 1943 airplanes were Razorbacks and they all had 305. Now, this chart was part of a presentation given to Hap Arnold in later 1943. The ranges are a bit low as compared with other USAAF data, but that's due to the conditions used, which thankfully are listed below. I know it's a bit blurry, but I'll read the conditions to you. Full power climb to 25,000 feet. Okay, that means maximum continuous power. Crews at 210 miles per hour indicated 300 miles per hour true. That's important. It has a big effect on range because of cruise speed just affects fuel economy a lot, just like in a car. Next, 15 minutes combat at military power and five minutes at war emergency power. That's going to use a lot of fuel. Then, of course, we have to return to base at the required cruising speed with the bombers and land with 30 minutes of reserve fuel. So, is that 150 mile radius correct? Does the math check out? Yes, it does, uh, certainly under those conditions. And we can easily calculate this because we know the fuel burn rate of the engines at various power levels and in crews, and we know the times to climb. I'll put up the relevant charts uh, at the very end of the video. I came up with the following numbers. Based on a 2300 horse P-47, so a mid-1943 model with water injection. And by the way, I'm not going to go over the numbers like this for every uh, situation that we're going to cover. I'm just doing it for this one so you can get an idea of the methodology. So 15 minutes of combat power, that's going to use 69 gallons. 5 minutes war emergency power, 26 gallons. 30 minutes of reserve, 40 gallons. Uh, 45 gallons for startup warm-up, taxi, and initial climb to 5,000 feet, then another 35 gallons to climb the remaining 20,000 feet up to 25,000. That uses 215 gallons total out of our 305 right there, only leaving us 95 gallons of fuel, which can take us 262 miles. Now, of course, we have to add that to the distance we covered during the climb, and I get within two miles of uh, the numbers with that uh, we've got on the chart here. So, yeah, that 150 mile radius works out about perfectly under these conditions, and I do think those conditions are reasonable, but very conservative by World War II standards. Back to this map for a moment, notice that it shows 230 miles for a P-47 on internal fuel. Where did that number come from? And by the way, you'll see that number all the time if you start researching uh, World War II European theater escort stuff. And that number comes from this official chart. In June of 1943, P-47s started extending the radius out a bit, largely due to the pilots having more experience and more, com and more confidence in their aircraft and their own abilities, including navigational ability. In other words, they plan for less use of combat power and less reserve fuel and could cruise at lower speeds due to the emerging tactic of escorting the bombers in shifts. Now, remember that 200 gallon drop tank that was available back in 1943. Let's look at the range with that installed. It's easy because we have all the numbers right in the pilot's manual and we know the conditions they were using around that time. Using the same requirements set forth already, I get a 424 mile radius. I'll put that on the Schweinfurt raid map and add in a red line at the 424 mile point. 
As you can see, if the Thunderbolts had their 200 gallon drop tanks, they would have escorted the bombers, or they would have been able to escort the bombers, all the way to the target and back, no problem. The fact that they didn't was due to bureaucratic nonsense causing the tanks to be unavailable, not limitations of the plane itself. So when did drop tanks come into operational use on the P-47 in Europe? The first example that I can find of a combat P-47 mission in Europe with a drop tank was on August 12th, 1943. Uh, we're talking about missions by the 8th Air Force here. Now, the 56th Fighter Group used them to escort bombers attacking Gelsenkirchen, hopefully I'm saying that right, which was about 245 miles from the 56th base at Halesworth. This is documented in several places, including the book Thunderbolt by Martin Caden and Robert S. Johnson. Johnson actually flew on that mission and mentions the drop tank specifically. The tank they used was a 108-gallon unit made out of compressed paper by the British. That construction method and location solves a lot of logistical problems, makes it easy to get the tank to the P-47 bases. Using the same data as before, um, the slide has range for this tank. It brings the combat radius up to 300 miles. I did the calculations myself using the same requirements um, for reserve fuel, etc., and I get about the same number. The number from later USAAF documents using less conservative variables puts the combat radius at 375 miles for that tank, which is where that number comes from on this map, and it's a very common number um, in books on this subject. Now, at this point, it should be clear that with proper planning, there should have been no need to send bombers unescorted to Schweinfurt on August 17th of 1943, and certainly not for the second raid on October 14th. The 200-gallon tank had been available for at least eight months before the August raid. The 108-gallon compressed paper tank came out just before the first Schweinfurt raid and was actually used on that day. Um, there's a little bit of a complicated story there. The, the first Schweinfurt raid, they were going to hit two cities simultaneously to divide up German forces, and the Thunderbolts that had drop tanks were supposed to escort bombers to Regensburg, which was the other city they were going to hit. Uh, things got all messed up, and nothing happened. So nothing good involving the P-47. So the Thunder, no, but no Thunderbolts with drop tanks escorted bombers to Schweinfurt on that day, although the drop tanks were used on that day. I guess that's my point. Now, I understand they probably didn't have enough of them for that first raid on the 17th of August, but there really isn't any good excuse for not having them for the second raid in October. Of course, the 108-gallon tank won't get the 47 all the way to Schweinfurt, but it gets them darn close within about 50 miles, assuming they launched from Halesworth, where the 56th was based. That would have left the bombers unprotected for only a short time, and that wouldn't be that big of a deal because the German fighters would typically not fly into the flak over the city. Plus, the only reason we're even talking about the 108-gallon tank is because the USAAF leadership didn't get the 200-gallon tanks to England because of their own short-sightedness. I want to mention that the 200-gallon tank was fully tested up to 30,000 feet. This is important because there was another compressed paper tank of about the same size, not the 108 gallon unit, but a bigger one around 200 gallons, which could not be used at higher altitudes. Thus, they were typically only filled up about halfway and then dropped um, once they were empty. That's not the case with the tank, the 200 gallon tank I'm discussing here. And people often confuse these and incorrectly state that the metal 200 gallon tank from Republic couldn't be used up high. So I think that pretty well covers the range of the early P-47s and should remove any doubt about the P-47's ability to escort bombers to Schweinfurt. Now let's get into the late 1943 Thunderbolts. We'll use a November 1943 manual for this data. At this point, fuel tank options for the Thunderbolt get confusing and numerous. Republic changed some things, and starting with the D5RE model in late 1943, the plane has two belly tank options, 
and could carry wing tanks. Gone was the big 200 gallon belly tank, replaced by either a 75 or 150 gallon tank. One drawback to the older 108 gallon paper tank was that when mounted on the belly, it couldn't be used on really rough airfields because it hung so low to the ground at the back. These new tanks didn't have that issue, and when combined with wing tanks, gave the Thunderbolt enough range to escort bombers to Berlin. That's important because it's still 1943. This is way before the USAAF actually launched a daylight raid on Berlin. Now that 108 gallon tank could also be mounted on the wings on these newer Thunderbolts, which solved any ground clearance problems. The twin 108s gave the P-47s escorting bombers a range of 475 miles from base. Using the more conservative numbers from the earlier slide, still about 450 miles. But either way, with dual 108s, the P-47s had enough range to escort the bombers to most possible targets. Of course, we could still add in a 75 or 150 gallon belly tank. Here's a 47 with dual 108s and a 150. There is no range chart I can find for this configuration. It probably existed, but a lot of information was lost when Fairchild destroyed the records of Republic aircraft in 1987. That was a huge loss of information, and sadly, had they waited just a few years, it all could have been put into electronic media. There was an article about this in Air and Space magazine. Apparently, all that was saved from the Republic records was this single document, which was part of the first purchase order of P-47s. Now, let's not get sidetracked. Back to range. So, while I don't have official charts for this configuration, and you know the reason why, I'm at least okay at calculating this stuff, and range doesn't go up as much as you might think because you add more and more drag to the airplane, thus you have to use more power to maintain those higher cruise speeds needed for escort, and thus you use up more fuel. Of course, range still goes up, and in this case I figure that with the triple tank combination of the P-47, combat radius on escort duty was at the very least 550 miles. Thus, by November of 1943, the P-47 had a fuel tank combination that would allow it to escort bombers all the way to Berlin. Back to our chart. We've covered the first four here. The fifth was the proposal to put twin 150-gallon tanks under the wings. We have to talk about these. They were not only proposed, they were used. They're installed on this airplane. These tanks were derived from the tanks we saw earlier on the Lockheed Ventura. They're darn close to the same thing. There are enough pictures of them that it's a certainty that they were used from late 1943 into 44. However, I'm not so sure they were used on escort missions. They are mentioned in the appendix of the 1943 November flight manual, and we do have some range data for this configuration. How, however, um, none of the data in the appendix gives range numbers at altitudes above 10,000 feet at lower power settings uh, that you would want to use for long range. And none of the numbers were flight tested. They were all preliminary. These charts show that these tanks could give a range of about 1,400 miles or a combat radius of around 700 miles, which is tremendous. However, uh, for escorting purposes, the reality isn't nearly that good. It appears that in order to maintain the required cruise speed while escorting bombers, so much extra fuel is needed to offset the extra drag that fuel consumption goes up a lot. If you factor that in, the 500 mile number from this chart seems very reasonable. And remember, the dual 108s using the same condition can go 450 miles. So they also considered putting 150 gallon wing tanks on the P-51 as seen in the chart here. I don't think that idea went anywhere. I couldn't find a picture of a P-47 going on, correction, a P-51 going on a combat mission with 150 gallon wing tanks. Probably happened, but judging from this chart, the big tanks hurt the P-51's performance a lot because both the P-47C and P-51B with these tanks and normal maximum internal fuel have the same combat radius, 500 miles. 
Speaking of the P-51, this is a good point to have a little comparison between the 1943 versions of the 47 and the 51. I'm going to use fuel tank combinations that we know existed, and I'll use the conditions from this chart. The USAAF switched to less conservative conditions for range calculations later, which I know of because of this document. But for now, we're using the 1943 conditions since I'm comparing 1943 variants. Starting from the top, as we can see, the versions of the P-47 available in 1943 could not go far on 305 gallons internal fuel. The P-47s from very early on could escort bombers over 420 miles from base if equipped with its 300, correction, with its 200 gallon belly tank. That was easily enough for the 47s to escort bombers to and from Schweinfurt, as well as Bremen, Hanover, Cologne, Frankfurt, and many other locations deep in Germany. In late August and into October, P-51s started showing up, although not yet in Europe. Um, these were B and C models, which, by the way, are the same. It just depends on which factory they were built in. Now, the B or C could, go, could take 180 gallons of internal fuel normally and could only go a little bit farther than a P-47 on internal fuel when doing escort duty. Both planes would need drop tanks to effectively escort bombers into Germany. Note that both planes get more internal fuel later, so don't worry, we're getting to that. The P-51B at this stage could carry dual 75-gallon drop tanks. This allowed it to escort bombers all the way to Berlin. No later than November, new variants of the 47 became available, which could mount drop tanks on the wings. With dual 108s, which was a common configuration, they could escort bombers to most targets in Germany west of Berlin. With dual 108s and the 150-gallon belly tank, it could provide escort duty all the way to Berlin. The P-51Bs and Cs could also carry dual 108s, which would give them a range of 700 miles. As far as I can tell, that never happened until February of 44, but I'm listing it here because it's certainly possible it could have done it in 43. Now, let's look at maximum ranges for missions other than escort duty. We talked about the 150-gallon wing tanks available for the 47. There were also 300-gallon wing tanks. It's a certainty that both of these were available, but I don't think the 300-gallon tanks were used in combat missions over Europe. I'm not even 100% certain they were used on the P-47s at all. So let's start with the 150-gallon tanks. There are plenty of pictures of them, but I haven't seen evidence of them being used on escort missions in 1943. Once again, doesn't mean it didn't happen. On a long-range mission, accounting for reserves and combat with dual 150s, the P-47 can have a combat radius of 725 miles. Now, I have to be clear, it can't fly escort duty that way. It gets that range by throttling back and flying at optimal altitudes for fuel economy. Also, to get that range, of course, it can't drop the tanks early. Um, and that's an important condition we're going to talk about later. Now, the 300-gallon tanks are a bit more complicated. Again, can't find a single picture of a P-47 with these tanks. I see a lot of references to them, though. Um, and I have seen them being used on references battle. Um, I've seen references to them being used in battles at Moritai Island. But no solid evidence. Uh, this P-47 is on that island in the Pacific, and it appears to have dual 150-gallon tanks. The complication is the 150s and 300s are actually very similar in appearance. The 300s are a bit longer and wider, normally about a foot in each dimension. Um, one way to tell if there's, is if there's a person next to it, they're easy to tell apart because the 300s are actually big enough to put a person in, which they did. Uh, these are actually 310s, but essentially the same in dimension and with the plexiglass front um, that turns them into a cozy transport capsule. To give you an idea how rare these big drop tanks were, consider that in 1943 there was a P-38 squadron which was assigned to attack Admiral Yamamoto. You've probably heard about that. And there were not enough of the big tanks to go around. So the P-38s on that mission flew with one 300-gallon tank on one side and a smaller one on the other. 
Um, that's kind of interesting because the asymmetry problem isn't really a big problem for the P-38. So we know the tanks existed, um, and they existed in, late, in greater numbers later in the Pacific. Um, and they're specifically mentioned as viable manuals in the 1943 November P-47 manual. So with a pair of these, just how far could a 47 go on a non-escort combat mission? That comes out to a radius of 1150 miles. So if we compare the non-escort ranges, the P-47 and P-51 are about equal in 1943. With dual 150s and dual 75s respectively, the 47 has a combat radius of about 725 miles versus 660 for the P-51. But if we compare the two planes with dual 300s on the 47 and dual 150s on the 51, the, 40, the 47 still has the edge with about 1150 to 1100. Remember that the 150 tanks for the Thunderbolts and 75s for the Mustang absolutely existed and were used. There's no question about that. The 300s on the Thunderbolt and the 150s on the Mustang are not exactly fantasy because they're listed in the manuals, but I think they're bordering on fantasy. If anyone can post a link to a picture from 1943 that shows otherwise, please do so. So while the Thunderbolt may have had a very small advantage in non-escort ranges in 1943, of course over Europe at that time it was the escort ranges that really mattered. So let's get back to that. These numbers, which are right out of the flight manuals, were a huge problem for the USAAF leadership. Casualties were extremely high, and after the second Schweinfurt raid in October of 43, there could be no doubt that the only answer was to employ long-range escort fighters. That in itself wasn't really a problem. There were three available, the 47, 51, and of course the P-38, which I'm largely leaving out of this video because it's a complicated topic I'm going to have to tackle another time. The problem was, there were butts to be covered and careers to be saved. The USAAF leadership, which was mostly the bomber mafia at this point, had to come up with a reason why they now needed escort fighters but hadn't been using them all along. The narrative they decided to run with was this. They said they didn't have a plane that could do it until the Merlin-powered P-51 arrived. There was a further sub-narrative that the long-range P-51 Mustang could not have been foreseen because it was just a fluke that some rogue officers in Britain thought up the idea of putting a Merlin into a P-51. That sub-narrative is not true, but it's something I'm going to cover a different time. Now, in order to perpetuate this myth, they were very selective with statements about range. You could call it lying via omission. For example, there would be no or very few references to the 200-gallon drop tank that had been available for the 47 throughout all of 1943. The existence of that tank alone kills their whole false narrative. Thankfully for the Bomber Mafia, it was pretty easy to ignore that tank because by late 1943, it had been replaced by newer tanks anyway. Next, mention over and over that the original P-47 in Europe was not equipped to carry drop tanks. Ignore the fact that those were B models built in very small numbers and replaced or upgraded quickly. Also, never mention the fact that the entire reason the B models didn't have drop tanks is because they were banned on pursuit airplanes in 1939 by the very people now in charge of the USAF. Another tactic in creating this myth was to always compare a later P-51 to an earlier P-47. For example, an August 1943 Thunderbolt to a June 44 Mustang. In some cases, this was compounded by the fact that they used different requirements for reserve fuel and combat fuel, which made the ranges appear to go up in 1944 anyway. Over time, all of these misleading statements were repeated over and over until they became accepted history accepted but false. Let's take a look at the 8th Air Force Tactical Development Document. We're going to be talking about this one a lot. This document is used as source material in countless books and articles written after the war. It's very good in the sense that it's packed full of useful information that would be very difficult to find anywhere else. Charts like these. And as far as I know, it's all very accurate. But in regards to aircraft range, it presents 
very carefully selected facts, specifically in regard to escort fighter range. Let's jump down to page 97. This is the page that typically serves as original source material for range information on World War II U.S. European theater fighters. I know this will be a bit tedious, but I want to cover this page line by line. After all, I am making the case that the range myth was intentionally created, so I have to be thorough here. It starts out saying that on internal fuel, the P-47 had a combat radius of around 175 miles. As pilots gained experience and confidence, in part due to new equipment, that was extended out to 230 miles in June of 1943. Yeah, okay, fair enough. Uh, although there was no new equipment during that time period that extended range on internal fuel, but I think the numbers themselves there are fine. Next paragraph, the first practical drop tanks of 75 gallon capacity were added in July of 43. That's true, the 75 gallon tank was added about that time. That same tank was also used on a number of other aircraft. Combat radius with the 75 was 340 miles. Uh, that's true, not enough to cover uh, the Schweinfurt raids. Next, they talk about the 108 gallon paper tank first used, according to them, on August 17th the day of the first Schweinfurt raid. Um, it was actually used a little bit earlier than that, but uh, that's fine. Now, that 375 mile range would not get a 47 to Schweinfurt and back, but it would get it close, and that would have helped the bombers quite a bit and would have reduced losses. However, they didn't even try because they were still believing their older doctrine. The Schweinfurt escorts didn't even have these tanks. The 108 gallon paper tank had the fact that it showed up had nothing to do with USAAF leadership. It was driven and created at the local level near bases in England by two colonels who were apparently fed up waiting for the drop tanks to come through the normal and official supply chain. Okay, they mention the 150-gallon belly tank being first used in February of 44. That's true. Uh, it was available a little earlier, but, but it's a true statement. They mention twin 150s. Now, this is important. In three other sections of this publication, including on the chart on this very page, the 475 mile range is given for dual 108 gallon paper tanks, and the math for that checks out. So that's a misprint there. Finally, they mention that the P 47s could go beyond Berlin when not on escort duty. What's important here is what they didn't mention. They left out three very important factors, all of which destroy the false narrative um, that the USAAF was unable to provide escorts into Germany prior to the P-51 Mustang showing up. First of all, they didn't mention the 200-gallon belly tank that had been available for all of 1943. The existence of that tank destroys the whole false narrative, so of course it's not mentioned. The fact that they didn't have these tanks in Europe, or at least not in any numbers, was entirely due to decisions made by the USAAF leadership, and not due to any technical limitations or problems with the tanks. They even try to imply, through very careful wording, at least as I see it, that the first practical drop tank was the 75-gallon unit, which started to show up in July of 43. It may have been the first practical 75-gallon tank, but not the first practical drop tank for the Thunderbolt. Second, they fail to mention that by late 1943, the P-47 could carry a belly tank in combination with wing tanks, extending its escorting range all the way to Berlin and a bit beyond. Third, they don't mention the next generation of P-47s, which came out in around May of 44 and had 370 gallons of internal fuel. That's a lot of planes. It's all the bubble tops. And they could escort with dual 165-gallon wing tanks and a 215-gallon belly tank. So they just utterly ignored uh, the longer-range 1944-1945 Thunderbolts. So this whole section is a list of fuel configurations and dates designed to make it look as if the P-47 had less range than it actually did. In other words, it's designed to hide the fact that the P-47s could have escorted bombers on both of the raids to Schweinfurt. 
Now let's see what they said on the same page about the P-51. Do you think they treated the Mustang the same way? Quote, in January 1944, P-51s began escort duty. Without external tanks, the P-51 could escort to a point 475 miles from base. It's noteworthy that this is the same as the ultimate escort range of the P-47, equipped with two 108-gallon wing tanks. Unquote. Wow, is there a lot of misdirection there. Yes, P-51s did start escorting in January 44, maybe actually February, but I'm not going to split hairs here. How do they get to that 475-mile number? Well, you may remember the slide earlier showed 170 miles on internal fuel. 170 versus 475, that is a huge difference. Yes, they're using different data now for combat fuel and reserves, but not enough to make a change that big. I could see going from 170 to 240 or something. What they're actually doing is using the range for a P-51 with 269 gallons of internal fuel as opposed to the 180 gallon tank. Uh, note it's 267 gallons, give or take two, depending on the original source you use. Now in January of 44, the P-51Bs and Cs were available. And normally at this point, they had a maximum fuel capacity of 180 gallons of internal fuel. Now the later D models would have 269 gallons, but those won't show up until June of 44. There were kits which could upgrade the B models and C models to 269 gallons, but they were not standard when the plane was new. Thus, they're using a best case scenario for a P-51 on internal fuel. Uh, now, I'm not sure what a fair start date would be to use the 269 gallon P-51 for comparison. If somebody has original source data to uh, point that out, I think that would be really nice to see. I can't find that date in the production. You know, it's interesting. You can find serial numbers, all kinds of other things, but the date at which they started putting that fuel tank configuration in B's and C's is very hard to find. Anyhow, thankfully, we can tell which B and C's have the extra tank by just looking at the left side of the airplane because you can see the filler cap for the extra tank in the aft fuselage. This plane does not have one. This captured one does. And sometimes I just can't tell. For example, I think this plane does, but perhaps that thing there I'm seeing isn't a cap and spilled fuel. It's just uh, something else. So based on this, based on the pictures I'm looking at, and it's also sometimes very difficult to date the pictures exactly, but I suspect that by March or certainly by June of 44, more P-51s had the 269 gallon tank than didn't. Back to the report, of course they used the worst case scenario for the 47 as they didn't even mention the version that had 370 gallons of internal fuel. So they don't mention the 47 with the increased fuel tanks, and they only mention the 51 with the increased fuel internal fuel. Now, notice it says that 475 mile range is the same as the ultimate escort range of the 47 with dual 108s. Okay, that's true for a P-47 with 305 gallons of internal fuel and dual 108s. However, that's far, far from the ultimate range configuration for a P-47. Not only would the 370 gallon version show up around May of 44, but triple tank configurations were possible in late 1943. So that statement is just hugely misleading because it sort of implies that 475 miles is the ultimate escort range for the 47, which is far from the truth. So the entire page, at least the way I see it, is set up to present the P-47 in the worst possible light in terms of range and the P-51 as the first and only plane that could escort to Berlin. It uses very carefully selected facts and misleading statements to create a false impression to hide the failings of the USAAF leadership. Now let's move on and talk about the later P-47s used in Europe and compare them to the later P-51s. Excluding November models, which I'll get to later, all bubble top P-47s and a very small number of Razorbacks had 370 gallons of internal fuel via a larger main tank. Uh, 
This does a lot for range because combat range is hugely affected by internal fuel. That is combat range when you expect to fight other aircraft. Think about it this way. If we're flying a P-47 with dual drop tanks and we see an enemy 109, we're probably going to have to drop those tanks or we're going to be fighting with a big disadvantage. Once the tanks are dropped, if we want to get home, we're going to have to do that on internal fuel. Thus, our maximum combat radius is the distance we can travel on internal fuel minus the fuel needed for combat and reserves. So with drop tanks beyond a certain point, it doesn't matter how big they are for escort duty, for the purposes of escort duty, our range is going to be limited by internal fuel. For example, the 47D25 with 370 gallons of internal fuel will have about 360 gallons on board when the tanks are dropped. Not 370 because the main tank has to be used for engine startup and takeoff. The pilot can switch to the drop tanks for long taxi and of course right after takeoff. I'm going to figure 10 minutes of combat and a 20 minute reserve because that seems to be in harmony with the numbers used for planning later in the war, certainly by 44. During that 10 minutes, I'll factor in two minutes at war emergency power. So out of that 360 gallons, that's going to leave us with 270 gallons to get home. That amount of fuel will take us 689 miles at over 300 miles per hour. So regardless of how much fuel we have in the drop tanks, that's really the upper limit of a P-47 bubble tops possible escort range. Of course, that's darn good. 689 miles is really far. Now let's compare that to a P-51D, both of which would have been pretty common in mid-1944. The Mustang goes about twice as far per gallon of fuel, which really helps it here. It will outrange the P-47, but by how much? The 51 carries 269 gallons internally. However, unlike the 47, Due to a center of gravity issue, it has to burn 40 gallons from the aft fuselage tank before going into combat. People often forget this when they're calculating range. Thus, when it drops its external tanks, it's down to 224 gallons right away, assuming the pilot used the main for startup and takeoff uh, as he did in the 47. The 47 and 51 have the same limitations there. Figure in 10 minutes of combat and reserves, and we have 175 gallons to get us home. That's actually a lot of fuel in the 51, and gives us a massive 923 miles of range. But that leaves us with two more questions. First, how far into Germany could the two planes get on the fuel in the drop tanks? And how far do they need to go to escort? The Thunderbolt in mid-44 could carry dual 165s and a 150-gallon belly tank. Unfortunately for the Thunderbolt, it sucks down fuel at an incredible rate if dragging those tanks through the air fast enough to provide escort duty. However, that's still a lot of fuel, and it can go 610 miles before it has to drop the tanks. Since that's less than the range once it drops the tanks, we know that the P-47, 25 and later with triple tanks can provide escort duty for about 610 miles and then have plenty of fuel for the fight uh, and the trip back home, more than we actually plan for here. The 51D with dual 108s could go about 836 miles before dropping the tanks during escort duty, so it could go farther. Uh, Mid-47's maximum escort range is about 610 miles versus about 830 for the P-51. Of course, these are maximums. Wind or increased combat time will shorten them, although they'll shorten them more for the P-51, because remember the P-51 could go 689 miles once it drops its tanks. But still, no matter how you slice it, a mid-1944 Mustang has more range for escort purposes than a mid-1944 Thunderbolt. But does that support the official narrative? No, it doesn't. It certainly makes it easier to sell because you can factually say that the Mustang has more range and can escort farther. But either one can easily escort bombers to their targets in Germany. 
I'll put up a map of modern Europe and add a line for scale. Even if we knock off a hundred miles due to wind and extra combat time, escorting to Berlin wasn't a problem for the Thunderbolt, for the bubble top Thunderbolt. Here's a USAF map of bomber ranges. What we want to look at here is the practical range shown in red. As you can see, a P-47D-25 can escort a B-17 about as far as it can go on a bombing mission. That practical range shown on the chart in red may seem short to those of you who have looked up B-17 ranges or perhaps read books about it, but this chart is factoring in something that people forget about, and that is the huge amounts of fuel consumed during formation assembly. The entire formation is limited by the fuel of the first plane to take off. Now just for completeness, I'll add in the P-47 November. This plane packs 270 gallons in the main tank, like the later D models, plus the 100 gallon aux tank, but adds in an extra 180 gallons in the wings, coincidentally the same amount of wing fuel P-51s carry. This model only saw combat in the Pacific, although it was designed to do long-range escort missions. It never really did much of that due to the island-hopping nature of uh, the war in the Pacific. The U.S. Marine Corps kept giving it bases far enough forward that it just didn't ever need its really long range, or if it did, it was rare. However, the plane did have tremendous range. That extra fuel, the new wings, and manual leaning techniques, which were now coming into favor, really helped. The P-47 November had a combat radius even when escorting B-29s as of over 1,000 miles with its dual 165-gallon wing tanks and single 110-gallon belly tanks. And it could carry more. It could carry dual 300s for extra long-range non-escort missions. Uh, the range of the November is just tremendous. It, it has longer range than the P-51 in escorting and significantly longer in non-escorting missions. So let's sum all this up. Before the war, the Bomber Mafia, which had control of the USAAF, was so convinced in their belief that bombers would not need fighter escorts that they derailed attempts to provide fighters with drop tanks. They clung to these beliefs during the bombing campaigns in 1942 and throughout most of 1943 even trying to use other bombers as bomber protection rather than supply fighters in Europe with drop tanks, the drop tanks that were already available. So even though they were available in the U.S. for manufacturing, U.S. commanders in Europe had to go a bit rogue and work with the British to get a decent supply of drop tanks in 1943, which led to the famous paper 108-gallon tank, I want to mention that that paper 108 gallon tank is one of the really big contributions by the British that never gets mentioned, much like the Pacific Fleet that we talked about earlier. It's sort of ironic to me that in World War II history, the British never seem to get credit for a lot of the stuff they deserve, but then get credit for stuff that uh, they either didn't deserve or, some, or really had minimal effect on the war. Anyhow... That's all. Those are stories for another time. So, facing huge losses, the USAAF leadership had to fabricate a story. A story that would allow them to start using fighter escorts while at the same time explaining why they hadn't been doing it all along. Remember, the loss of life uh, due to this was tremendous. The total casualty numbers of the USAAF are very comparable to the total casualty numbers of the U.S. Marine Corps in the Pacific through the entire war, and that's an incredible statistic. So, the story they fabricated was that the P-47 didn't have the range, and only when the P-51 with the Merlin engine showed up did they have a fighter that could do the job. They then promoted this misinformation by hiding the true story of drop tanks and inserting misleading facts. I want to take a moment to thank my Patreon supporters uh, who got early access to this video and will get early access to the next two aircraft videos. I really appreciate every single one of you and I also answer every single question that comes to me over Patreon. Although please understand, sometimes it might take me two or three weeks to get to it depending on when the question comes in. I can only answer those from home.
Um, when I'm on the road, it's difficult for me to sign in uh, to Patreon from, from uh, locations other than my house because the Patreon system needs to recognize where I am. And sometimes I can do it if my wife sends me the question, I can email it back to her and she'll send it to you. But generally speaking, uh, when I'm on the road, I can't answer questions, but uh, just have faith that I will answer it. I do answer all of them at some point. Uh, this particular video, I want to mention, it actually started out as a video about firepower and offensive systems of the P-47. And in that video, I ended up mentioning range. And uh, one thing led to another. Next thing I knew, I had about 10 minutes of content on range. And I thought, well, I'll just put out a miniature video on that. And uh, that turned into this video. So um, I'm almost done with the firepower video. So I'll get that up pretty soon. Uh, P-47 firepower and offensive systems. And also I have another video coming up soon. People seem to want to know what I'm working on next. Um, and I'm working on a lot of stuff. But the video after that will probably be a video that a lot of people have been asking for. And it's a very good comparison between a late war European theater US fighter and a late war German fighter. I'm, uh, I've been wanting to make that video for a long time and I'm pretty excited about it. I want to mention something on uh, escort ranges because I just thought about this. This is probably going to come up in comments. Somebody may notice that when I calculated escort ranges and also the way the USAAF calculated escort ranges, they didn't factor in weaving. The fighters would typically fly a bit faster than the bombers, thus they would have to weave in order to not get too far ahead of them. And weaving has a tremendously negative effect on range. So why didn't I factor that in and why didn't the USAAF factor that in? And the reason is that weaving became unnecessary fairly early on. Uh, the USAAF employed two specific tactics, which are very close to being the same thing, to eliminate the need for weaving. The first tactic was they would, they developed a relay system, or I think what I referred to in the video as escorting bombers and shifts. They developed a relay system so that uh, one group of fighters would, would fly at a certain speed, it would be effective for fuel economy, and then another, because they took off at a different time, would meet those fighters at a certain point and then the first group would go home and, and the next one would continue escorting for some distance. So the USAF had so many airplanes relative to the Germans that they were able to do this. They didn't need to send all their fighters at one time to escort the bombers. So the relay system eliminated the need for weaving and also the second tactic used was, um, I, I forget what the actual term for this is, but they would assign an area along the bomber's route for the fighters to defend. In other words, Squadron A would defend this section of the bomber's route, Squadron B the next, and so on and so forth. So uh, because of those two systems, weaving really went out of fashion pretty early, and that's why it's not used in range calculations. Um, all, details on that stuff are all in that 8th Air Force document that we talked about. And when I use primary source documents, I like to use stuff that is I don't know what the term would be, but really, really primary source. For example, a flight manual from a manufacturer. You know, you can really count on that. Um, this particular document from the 8th Air Force, Air Force uh, came out just after the war in Europe came to an end. And while it was a tremendously good summary and there's a lot of really great information in there, um, there was definitely some political motivations for certain things in there, uh, specifically the escort ranges. But it is a very good document, and if you like reading about World War II and, and, and researching stuff, uh, it's a very good one, and it's free for downloading, or at least it is now. I'm, I'm One of the things I'm noticing is, and this has only started happening in the last six months or, year, or the last year, a lot of um, original source material from World War II are disappearing from the places where these things are hosted for free and are now behind paywalls or uh, you just have to pay to download it. For example, uh, you know, a really good copy of a P-47 Thunderbolt manual, um, there are, you know, those were all over the place. Well, they're not really great copies, i got to say that. But the exact same PDFs that were free six months ago 
all of a sudden uh, they're on websites where they're gone from the free websites and they're only on sites where they cost 12 bucks to download or whatever. And I understand there needing to be a little bit of a cost associated with those things. Um, but uh, I think that's, that's getting a little bit out of control. Maybe I need to come up with some place to put all these documents. So if somebody wants to reference uh, the stuff that I used in a video, like for example, the source material in this video are P-47 manuals, P-51 manuals, and that 8th Air Force document. Um, I'd like to have all those in one spot and maybe for every video. I should probably come up with a way of doing that. I'm just thinking out loud here, totally off script. Anyhow, um, that's it for now. And uh, there is a, oh, one more thing coming up. And I actually re-recorded this whole video. I was So what I say in there is not relevant. Um, because, well, I guess it's still relevant. I still don't have great sound quality, but I actually re-recorded this compared with uh, what I say in that little navy, naval room. So, hope everybody's having a good day, and uh, hope to see everyone here for the next video, and I look forward to reading your comments. Thanks, and goodbye. Oh, and uh, just one more thing. You know, I get a lot of complaints on these videos about sound. I, I totally get it, and this particular video is... A little bit echoey um, and it's not that I don't care it's that there's not much I can do about this and the reason is when I make these videos I'm traveling I'm on the road and I'm on the road uh, more or less 17 days a month and that I have to pack into well one carry-on size suitcase and one small uh, bag like an oversized briefcase so I don't have a lot of room I can't take extra recording equipment and stuff with me so everything's just done with cell phone iPad computers and so forth um, and at the moment, this video is particularly echoey because this is 2020, early 2020, the time of the coronavirus. And um, due to my schedule, I went to Italy. I'm currently at a Navy base in, uh, in Sicily. And uh, they put me in these, I guess it's, they now call it a hotel, but I think it probably used to be officer's quarters or senior enlisted man quarters. I don't know. But in any case... The it's extremely echoey. It has these hard walls, hard floors. Uh, there's nothing I can do about it. But hey, as a point of interest, I want to show you this to you guys. I think it's really cool. This is a, apparently a very old building that was uh, built before that was built and didn't have electricity except maybe in the ceiling for lights. So look at these baseboards, and it's pretty interesting. This is how they run the wiring all throughout the building. So I'm not, I'm not even sure if that one. No, that one doesn't have any wires in it. Um, but the baseboards run all around and then they go to electrical outlets and occasionally they go up to the ceiling to run wires from room to room. Here you go. Here's a good example. So anyway, I just thought that's interesting. I've never seen uh, anything wired that way before, but uh, apparently when they put electricity into really old buildings in Italy, that's how they do it. So that's it. I uh, hope to see everybody here for the next video. Goodbye.